Brett. Today, uh, this is just the way it's going to work. Hey, I got a couple of things for you this morning. First of all, the title of the message is um, going back to last week, and all you do, you do for the glory of God and what that looks like, but I'm calling this one Worm Theology. All right, and uh, you'll see why here in just a moment because some of us have worms in our theology. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 is where this comes from. All things are lawful, the Apostle Paul says, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Obviously, I do that. And then finally in verse uh, 31, I'm going to skip down just to move us along and move us ahead more quickly. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And today I'm going to talk about how difficult that really can be to do all things for the glory of God. Now, if you're in the theological circles, there's two things that are brought up many times. When you go and read about the glory of God, you're going to come across basically two categories on the glory of God. One of those first categories you'll come to is this thing known as intrinsic glory or the intrinsic glory of God. Now, let me explain that to you just very quickly. That means the substance of all that God is and all that he does. So an intrinsic glory is the substance of God. It means that God is glory. Let me say it to you this way. God is love. It's not an attribute of God. It is God. Glory is the same way with God. It is who he is. It's the sum of all of his perfections. It is the sum of all of his acts. It's the sum of everything he does. God is the God who was. God is the God who is. God is also the God who is to come. So this is our God, and God is full of his glory. The scripture tells us that heaven and earth are full of God's glory. God, when he is present, his glory is everywhere. It's, it's, it's just simply who he is. So we have to start there with an intrinsic glory. Now, is there anywhere that God is not? Absolutely not. So we should be able to see his glory and the attributes of his glory. Now, when I say attributes, I'm not talking because intrinsically he is glory, but there are attributes of his glory that are all around us. The sunshine or the sunlight, or the air we breathe, the very things that Roman 1 talks about as far as just seeing um, God's creation and knowing that his glory abounds. That's the intrinsic glory of God. And so sometimes when Scripture is talking about the glory of God, it's not talking about us attributing glory to him. It's talking to us about God truly being glory. The next one, the next thing you need to know is um, that we are called to ascribe glory to his name. Now, that's the difference. So you have God is glory, and then we're called to ascribe glory to his name. So the next one is called ascribed glory. So you have intrinsic glory, and you have ascribed glory. Now, a lot of times when we're reading in Scripture, the Scripture we just read, that's telling us to ascribe the glory of his name. All right, whatever we do, ascribe to the glory of God. In other words, however we do it, it should be going to the glory of God. Because the danger is, men, too often is we want the glory for ourselves. We want people to know when we walk in the room. We want people to know who we are. We want people to know that we have a voice. We want people to know how strong and how courageous we are. We want people to know our accomplishments. And what happens is we begin to ascribe glory to ourselves instead of ascribing glory to our God. So when we read about the glory of God, there's two ways you'll read about it in Scripture. The first one is the intrinsic glory, which is just God himself. And the second one is how we are to ascribe to him the glory due his name. That means to behold him. And the more we understand who he is, the more we will ascribe glory due to his name. Not our name, but to his name. So in Acts chapter 12, verse 21 I wanted to go here for a couple of reasons. One, in Acts chapter 12, we read about a man by the name of King Herod. And you probably know who King Herod was. You probably know the lineage of the King Herods, if you want, if you want to put a little S on the end of that. But Herod was not a good figure in Scripture. We see John the Baptist who um, loses his head to a King Herod. And so as we read in Acts chapter 12, verse 21, let me just kind of tell you what's taking place because... uh, I didn't put that in my notes, but maybe it'll help catch us up to to why 
what happens to Herod happens to Herod. First of all, he's arguing with his neighbors, basically basically Tyre and Sidon, and he's arguing with his neighbors, and, and basically they're kind of going back and forth with him. And, you know, sometimes we can treat one another as common, and, and here, to me, they're kind of treating Herod as common. He gets a little bit upset with them, and that becomes dangerous. If Herod became upset with you, you were at risk of losing something, maybe everything, maybe like your head. But here we see that that uh, basically they kind of come to their senses and they go, wait, isn't this the one who basically sends us food? We, we, we might ought to hush. We might ought to listen. So here's what Herod does. He goes back. He puts on his kingly robes. He dresses himself up with all of his gold and everything else. He comes out and he gives this speech. And Acts 12, 21 picks it up there. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. So here he's got all of his royalty on, he's got all of his clothing on, he's got all of his attire, and he comes out now and he's showing that I am king. You need to remember this about me, I am king. Verse 22, they shouted, this is the voice of God, not of a man. Immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, and some of your translations read this this way, immediately Herod did not ascribe the praise due God's name. The Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. That's the very next statement. So, so here you've got King Herod. Herod is of the Jews. Herod is not of the Romans. He's of the Jews. He's, he's, uh, uh, he's supposed to know God. He's supposed to, of course, ascribe to God and ascribe God's glory given to his name. But here, Herod, he steps out in all of his royalty, all of his majesty. He gives this incredible speech, and they go, man, this isn't just the voice of man. This is the voice of God. Now, there's something that ought to jump out of you here. This is why I call this worm theology, and I hope you saw it, because this is is backwards. Notice, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. That's backwards. He didn't die and was eaten by worms. He was eaten by worms, and he died. And I truly believe what God's telling us here is that Herod only saw the temporal and wasn't worried about the eternal. And so what happened to him happened in the temporal. He was eaten by worms. That's a painful way to die. Worms don't eat a whole lot as they're eaten. So there must have been a ton of worms on him. They're eating him from the inside out. So what you see on the outside Uh, is not really what's happening on the inside. So here are the people ascribing glory. They are ascribing glory. Now, remember, God's got his intrinsic glory, and then he's got his will for his people, his men, to ascribe him glory. And when we ascribe glory to something that is temporal, to someone who is temporal, it is dangerous because worms begin to eat. We, we're, we're not seeing what God wants us to see. We're not saying what God wants us to say. God wants all the glory because God is glory. He is glory. So we do, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. It doesn't matter how good Herod could speak. It didn't, doesn't matter how good Herod knew the scriptures. Herod was about himself. And because of that, and the men who were around him began to ascribe glory to him, and as they ascribed glory to him, the worms ate him up. And he didn't go on to say, hey, the Lord gave me this talent. The Lord gave me this position. The Lord assigned this over me. There was nothing like that coming out of King Herod. King Herod was simply about himself. Men, we've got to be careful out there. When we eat, when we drink, or whatever we do, we should do all for the glory of God. What do you think uh, of a man, or better yet, a Christian man's struggle is today? What do you think are our greatest struggles for Christian men? Come on, men. Pride, okay, is one. Selfishness is another one. No doubt we can see these things begin to bubble up in each one of us. But let's be honest. Do we do everything for the glory of God? I mean, man, I'm eating this green chili cheeseburger all to the glory of God. I'm drinking this whiskey, I'm drinking this beer, I'm drinking whatever alcohol's out there, all to the glory of God. I'm buying this fishing pole to the glory of God. <laughs> I'm, you're going to really like this one, Audie. I'm consummating with my wife to the glory of God. 
Come on, we're all men in here. We can say some things like that. Here's the deal. As long as it's your wife, don't be lusting after other women. And, women. and, and of course, we know that the, the temptation there is the temporal satisfaction or gratification of looking at women as objects instead of as a daughter of the living God and ascribing glory to his name for those that he gives us. Look, men, those are ridiculous and silly examples. I get it. But Paul is telling us there is liberty in life as long as we understand that everything we have, everything we do, everything we say, everything we act upon belongs to the one who created us. Don't get so fixated and tempted in the temporal that you take the glory and you receive or receive the ascribed glory that you think is due your name. God's not impressed. He wasn't impressed with King Herod and the worms ate him and then he died. There's a temptation to be great in our Christian walk, man, and I see this a lot. I see it in myself. And we feel like we need recognition. We put so many hours and so many thoughts and are in so many conversations and we write these messages and I pen so much only to teach for 20 to 30 minutes a couple times a week, maybe 40, okay, a couple times a week and then I walk away from it and won't pick it back up. Now I'll, I'll read, continue to read scripture and continue to write and those types of things but there are many times I just sit there and go, golly man, I don't even know if anybody's heard me and I, they don't know the hours it takes to put into this. And sometimes we feel like we need recognition. It's amazing to me, even I, I, I was uh, listening to a couple of men talk about their testimonies the other day, and I'm not picking on you. Um, uh, you're not in this particular group of men, but I will say this, that I was listening to them, and one of them was t- kind of told his testimony, and the other one tried to up his testimony. So in other words, well, yeah, you were a bad man. Let me tell you how bad I was. Okay, you did this, this, and this. We'll just put murder on top of there with mine. You know, so we, so we try to outdo. Here we go. Men are men, right? And what are we trying to do? Ascribe, see? And what happens, we're trying to say, hey, that's all about Jesus, but who are we lifting up? We're lifting up the old man. It becomes dangerous. Look, none of us are worthy. Some of us were so bad that God sent worms with scoops just to scoop us out of the ditch. That's how low we were. But, but are we trying to outdo one another? It shouldn't be that way. The temptation has always been there. Even as Christian men in our Christian walk, if we're not careful, instead of ascribed glory, we'll think we have intrinsic glory. And there's only one who has that. And when you look up those two terms, those are the two terms that come come to you as theologians, as men who study in the theological areas. Those are the two areas that we talk about, intrinsic glory and ascribed glory. And if we're not careful, we'll just think we're intrinsic and you can ascribe it to me. It's always a temptation. In my own life, I came into this because I came into ministry simply because um, God impressed it upon me. And I just knew that this is where I, I belong. I wanted to help any way I could. I mean, from moving chairs, it's fun to watch Penn and these young men around here pushing and loading and stacking, and, you know, that's good for you. It's good for you. But, but the flip side of that is it starts somewhere. You have this, this call to come into ministry and to serve, and that's the purest way to serve. But over time, I started associating success with being the biggest, being a great curriculum writer, wanting our youth group to be the greatest influence in Canyon, Texas, and the only way I knew to do that was to have the biggest one. And sometimes I still want those things. And it is very much, it very much could be for the wrong reasons. Instead of the glory of God, it may be to the glory of me. And I call this worm theology. And listen, men, worm theology starts young. It begins to eat on us at a very young age. My dad can beat up your dad. My bicycle is better than your bicycle. You know, when I was uh, young, all I wanted was a BMX bicycle for, for a couple of years there. I finally got one for Christmas. The problem with my bicycle is everybody else had Redline and Mongoose. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about, and I apologize to bore you with this, but I had a Huffy. I got a Huffy, 
And so we used to take them out, and we had what we called bar ditches. And bar ditches run along the side of the road, but they also, a lot of times, we cut ditches for irrigation. And we would jump those ditches on our bicycle. And I jumped so much that on that huffy, I lost all the bearings in my handlebars, just under the handlebars. They just started falling out. And before long, I even bent my front fork straight out. And I thought, well, you know, and my dad was like, man, son, you are hard on your bicycle. But I didn't want anyone to jump further. I didn't want anyone to ride, ride faster. I could ride a wheelie, you know, just pump a wheelie as, as far as you wanted to go. Why? Because all my buddies had the red lines and had the mongooses. And I wanted to be, if I couldn't have a bicycle as nice as theirs, I was sure going to be able to outride them. I remember I borrowed a, 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 a kid's um, red line once, and I just wanted to ride his red line, and he kept coming down and wanting to jump over this big jump. And I kept telling him, dude, you got to hit that thing. There was a hill in front of it and come down, and he would start softening up and slowing down, and he'd kind of hop off that thing. And I mean, it, it was probably this high, a uh, big mound of dirt, and you had to kind of come down the side of the canyon and go to this perfect setup. I said, can I borrow your bicycle? Let me show you. Show you a little something. And I just let it fly down that hill. And I was going to sail. And I finally had a red line under me. And um, right before I get to the jump, I lost my front wheel some way. And I mean, I just boom and just came flipping off that jump every which way in the world. And he was angry with me. And he told his parents that I ruined his red line. But I won. <laughs> Thought I did. Right? You may have Nikes. Someone else is going to have Adidas, Adidas or vice versa. My fish... The fish I caught, men, come on, it starts young, was this far from the bank. But the truth is, we're always in competition. Competition isn't necessarily a bad thing, but, but what's a beautiful thing that can be about competition is simply this, is it causes us to want to do better, to be better. But we have to be careful because if, if we're not, we'll try to, to, to bring upon all the praise and make the praise about ourselves. We'll ascribe or want that praise for ourselves. The Olympics happened um, just a couple of weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, however long ago it was. And if you watch the Olympics, one of the beautiful things, they kept trying to take it off um, before they would say it, but you would see some of these athletes, right, get the gold medal, and then they would put a mic in their, in their uh, face, and, and they would say, I first and foremost want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So here they have a competitive spirit. They understand that God gave them a gift, and they're using that gift for the glory of God, and they weren't looking to bring the glory to themselves. I mean, it's a hard thing that we have to fight. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to idols. God will not have you or me receive the praise and honor that are due his name. Ascribed glory belongs to the Lord. So what do we do about this? I've got three points. We'll wrap this up. Quick message this morning, I hope. Never know. First of all, awareness of our humanity. So we say this a lot around here, awareness is the first step to responsibility, but we need to be aware of our humanity. Our lives should be examples of Jesus who stated, not my will be done, but thine be done. That's what God is looking for. It can be, it, it can and is natural to want to succeed in life. I mean, but success in our walk with Jesus is not found in our strengths, but many times it's found in our weaknesses. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Where does that start? With the blood of the lamb. What Jesus, what Christ has done for me. Look, those of you who have been delivered from addictions, whether it be pornography, whether it be uh, alcohol, whether it be um, um, overeating, that's probably the one I'm, I really do like to eat the older I get. There's just some satisfaction to me about that, and it's not good right? <laughs> I wasn't looking for the amen there, all right? But that's okay. So, so whatever it may be, it's not through our strength that we beat those things. It's, it's through our weakness that we make aware. We bring that to the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I need help. Strengthen me. Take me out of this. And we must be aware of the temptation to receive the glory. So awareness is the first step to responsibility. What if being aware isn't enough? You know, the Lord made Adam aware. It's interesting to me about Adam. Let me take a little side note for just a minute because with Adam, uh, if I were to ask you today, where and who did original sin come from? 
99% of us in this building would say it came from Adam. The truth, it didn't. There was already sin. It was an angelic sin. There was already a tempter who found his way into the garden to tempt Adam, and his name is Lucifer. And Lucifer, there's no doubt, he was the worship leader in the heavenlies, and he decided he wanted all the glory ascribed to himself, and God cast him down, and he became the very enemy of Adam and Eve, and men, he is still the very enemy of us today. So that's my second point awareness of the temptation. So first, be aware of your humanity, because in our humanity, we want to be great. But there's also a tempter out there that's telling us how great we are. Now, Jesus will tell us who we are and whose we are, and we should be secure in that. But the tempter will say how great you are. Let me ascribe to you, to your name, and careful, because that's worm theology. I love to read of John the Baptist, because John the Baptist, if anyone, I mean, he's, he's kind of the first one after 400 years of God remaining silent. Here, Elizabeth is, is pregnant with John the Baptist. He's the forerunner of Christ, and he has disciples himself. The disciples speak to him, and, and he's baptizing. He baptizes Jesus. There's so many great things that John the Baptist does, and yet John the Baptist stated, I must decrease, and he must increase. He ascribes the glory to his name. You know, um, there's no doubt that it, we've got to be aware that the tempter comes and wants to tempt us and tell us how great we truly are, how much we truly know, how far we can go in this life. Today, you don't just fight you, but you also fight an adversary, Satan and his demons. They want you to give the glory or praise to someone else and to receive it also for yourself. So give glory and praise to the greatest football team. Raise your hands at the Taylor Swift concert. Come on, men. Two of you, Bill, you were there two weeks ago. I mean, come on. Sometimes it's far more subtle than those things, though. Sometimes it's wanting a seat at the table, sometimes desiring to be great. Um, and it's, which, by the way, is different from being driven. It's simply wanting the glory. Satan will tempt us to, to rest and gloat in our accomplishments and to say, look at what I've done. Look how I broke out. Look how I became. When all the rest of my family are failures, I'm the one who succeeded. When everyone else um, couldn't figure out a way out, I was the one that, that didn't just figure it out. I dug out. And they all ascribed to me the glory, and they see how great I am. That's a dangerous place to be because Jesus will not, our God will not allow us to ascribe the glory to anyone else. So my third and final point this morning is simply this. Men, look to Jesus. You've got to look to Jesus because we fight, we fight not against flesh and blood, but, about, but against rulers and principalities who want to convince us to do life differently, that this life is your life. It's the only one you're getting. No, it better not be. There better be an afterlife, all right? But what we do in this life directly impacts our life to come in Christ Jesus. So look, there's so many there's so many uh, of us that will look to one another instead of first looking to Jesus. Jesus reminds us he only does what he sees his father do. He states, for, the, for this purpose, I've come to this hour. In John chapter 12, 27, as a matter of fact, I wanted to back that up. And I won't, you can go and read John chapter 12, incredible chapter. But you'll see where Jesus and God the Father have a conversation. And when they have this conversation, it's kind of interesting because basically he says, Father, glorify your name. He states, for this purpose I've come, so now, Father, glorify your name. And the father, you know what the Father says? I will. I'm about to glorify my name. And do you know how Jesus glorified the Father? He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be, we might be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, that, that, that may not sound like a whole lot. It's huge. Because let me tell you how... Jesus ascribed or brought glory to the Father. Jesus brought glory to the Father by giving his life so that the Father may have many sons. Those who would believe in him would come 
and be presented before him in Jesus. You see, John 17 is another one to look at because Jesus, once again, is speaking about how to bring glory to his Father. He gives his life for a bunch of sinners, and then he presents them as holy before his Father. This is known as the great presentation, but I'll talk about this later. Now, uh, let me end with this. So look to Jesus. Man, Jesus is the perfect example of how to ascribe the glory due our Father's name. John chapter 13, it was just before the Passover festival. Now, let me tell you what happened. In, in Mark chapter 10 and 11, uh, this, this is a forerunner to kind of what we see happen in John 13. There, there are uh, two scriptures that correlate, if you will. And so what you see are you see the disciples who are arguing who's going to be greatest. And I've taught and I've preached on that many times, right? But now here we have the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Notice he loves these guys. He loves these men. Verse 2, this is John 13, verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, when you ask the question, why did Simon betray Judas? You can go all the way back to original sin. One, he got glory. Don't you know that you have these Pharisees, Sadducees, religious scribes, you have those who would give him the money in order to betray his Lord? Well, when you look at that, what's he going to get? He's got people praising him for what he's going to do. Man, this becomes, I'm going to just take a side note. I'm going to take a little liberty for just a moment because this is important for us to hear. A couple of weeks ago, I was listening to a couple of, of men talk. Now y'all going to think I'm just eavesdropping. I'm going to use you as an example, and that's exactly right. <laughs> we learn from one another. But, but this one person had gone to this other person asking them questions and they began to tell them how wise they were, um, all the things. And, and I was like, this person needs to tell this person really what's going on because this is important because there's some things here uh, um, that are broken. And everyone knows this brokenness, and, 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 and he's made it very public, and, and he's not here. This is not, as a matter of fact, um, one of them goes to church here, the other one doesn't. But they're, they're visiting with one another. I've ministered to both, and I'm listening to the council that's going. And the council was just, hey, you're doing better, you're doing great, you know, this, this, and this. And this guy over here wasn't shooting straight with him. And, and the reason we don't is because we like to receive the glory. He's telling him how wise he is, how well he knows the Scripture, how everything else. And this man needs to say, yeah, well, you need to learn to apply the Scripture. There's some things here that we, we need to apply, that we need to look at, that we need to hold one another accountable to. That's how we grow. That's how we are transformed into the image of Christ. So when you look at this, you see that Judas goes to betray uh, Jesus, and and he's, he's probably lifted up even by the religious. So here you have all these men with all this education who supposedly know God, who, by the way, are followers of King Herod. And so you go back to this worm theology, and he's sitting here probably being told, hey, you're the greatest because you're about to put away this man. You're about to put him away for, for good. And so he's probably like, lacking hearing that about himself as much as receiving the money for it. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So now you have the disciples talking about how great or who's going to be the greatest, and they're still struggling over, over just the humanity in them. And Jesus gets up from the mill, takes off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Look to Jesus, men. So he, they're talking about how great they are. Jesus is the one who's going to present us to the Father in the great presentation. And yet here they are still in, in their temporal thoughts, in worm theology. It's going to be eaten up one day. And, and, and you see this beautiful picture of Jesus is saying, okay, I'm not just going to speak it. I'm about to show it. I'm going to apply it. So men, ascribe the glory to his name. He's intrinsically glorified, but we have the responsibility that in all we do, ascribe the glory to his name.
Dear Jesus, I thank you for these men as we go through these questions. Father, grow us up. Take us away from worm theology and into your pure purity, into your wholeness, into who you are and how we can better, Father, worship you in all we do. In your most holy name, amen.